So today we're going to go ahead and start setting up our Retro Pi build. And for that, I want to go ahead and use a Raspberry Pi 3. I like the built-in Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. You could go ahead and use dongles, but I like to leave those ports open in case I want to use USB controllers or really anything else. So we're going to need a Raspberry Pi, a 3 preferably. You're going to want a 5 volt 2.5 amp power source. Now this could be, well, from anything, either maybe you've got a wall outlet with a USB jack that supplies it, uh, maybe you're just going to get it right from the, the wall outlet, it doesn't really matter, there's lots of options out there. You need 5 volts, 2.5 amps. You're going to want an SD card, and you're going to want a class 10 or higher. Anything lower than a class 10, you're going to be upset with the performance that you're going to get from it. So try to make sure that you're getting a class 10 or higher. You're also going to want to have 8 gigs or larger for its capacity. Now you don't necessarily always need uh, you know, the biggest card that you can get. It really depends on how much you're going to be sticking on there. I like to stick a lot of things on there, but we've actually got a couple systems set up. Uh, one is just me throwing everything on there to test out and see what works. And the other scaled down version that my son uses for just the games that he likes. So his card is, I believe, a 16 gig, and it still has tons of room on it. And he's probably sitting at about maybe a thousand games total. He hasn't gone through them all yet. But these ROMs don't take up much room, but they do add up as you start putting more in. So if you're like me and you like to hoard, make sure that you've gone ahead and got a really large card. And well, let's go ahead and start setting this up. So open up our browser and point it to retropie.org.uk. I'll go ahead and leave links to all these websites down below in the description. But once you're on the front page, there's a couple ways to get to it. You know, download, get RetroPie, one or the other. Ultimately, you want to end up on a page that looks like this, or at least it looks like this right now. Who knows what it'll look like in the future. And then there's two versions you can get. If you have the Raspberry Pi 0 or the Raspberry Pi 1, download here. If you have the Raspberry Pi 2 or the Raspberry Pi 3, go ahead and grab it here. Now, if you don't have a Raspberry Pi yet and you're just thinking about getting one and you're taking a look at this, I would highly recommend grabbing the latest version that's out. In this case, the Raspberry Pi 3. It has a little bit beefier of a processor, plus it has the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth built in, so it frees up a couple of those dongles that you're not going to need or USB ports for controllers. So go ahead, click the one that you need. Go ahead and download it. I've already downloaded it over here at the side. And then if you're on Windows, you're going to need two other applications. The first one is 7-Zip so that you can unzip it. And then once you have it unzipped, you're going to need to program something similar to SD card formatter. Now, if you're working with a brand new SD card that you've never used before, it's fine. You can skip this step. But if you're going ahead and using an SD card that you've had in another device, chances are they've already put hidden partitions on there for you. And a regular format does not get rid of that. So you're going to want to try to find a program that does. SD card formatter does work for Windows. Then once you do have it formatted, you want to go ahead and pick something that can burn the image. Some people use Etcher. Uh, I've always used Win32 Disk Imager. It works fine for me. Etcher does have a nice, a nicer interface to it, but they both do the same thing. So pick the one that works for you the best. Now, if you're on the Mac side, all you're going to need is Apple Pie Baker. It'll do the formatting and the uh, image burning for you all in one. Now I would just come down and grab the latest version. Again, I'll leave links for all of this in the description. So the first thing you want to do is go ahead and uncompress this or unzip it. On Windows, you're using 7-Zip. On Mac, just double click it. It'll unzip for you. And we have it down here. Uh, it's a reasonably large file, so it might take a minute depending on the speed of your processor and whether or not you're recording in the background. <laughs> Now, once that's done, you're going to go ahead and get this image file. This is what you want to burn out to your SD card. So go ahead, insert your SD card. Here we go. Mine has popped up on my desktop right here. Now, in order to burn this image, I'm going to go ahead, open up my Apple Pie Baker. I have used this card before, so that means I will have to format it. And on Mac side, the Apple Pie Baker does both for me. On Windows, you're going to have to go ahead and use the SD card formatter first, unless it's a brand new card, in which case you're safe just to go ahead and burn. But I'll go ahead. I'm going to prep for noobs, which is essentially just formatting it into one big fat 32 partition with master boot record. 
And this should only take a couple seconds, even for a 32 gig card. Now, as I stated before, you want a class 10 or better card. Anything less than class 10, you're not gonna be happy with the performance. And ideally you wanna be able to get as large of a card as you can. While the ROMs are super small, they do accumulate over time. And if you're one of those people that just like to have access to thousands of games all on your RetroPie system all at once, well, we can go ahead down the road and take a look at how to add a actual drive to your RetroPie, as in a physical hard drive. But then to me, that loses its portability, but it is an option. Let me know down below in the comments if that's something you wanna see. But right now we're just gonna burn that image. So I'm gonna go ahead and take a look for it. Now I just realized this has a two at the end because I actually already have the image on my desktop. But with that done, go ahead, hit uh, restore backup, or if you're on Windows, make sure you're loading this up in the Win32 disk imager. But go ahead and burn that off. And this will take a little bit, depending on the speed of your card, the speed of your card reader, and just your system overall. Now, when this is done, it's gonna automatically eject the card for us. Then we can go ahead and take that and put it into our Pi to boot up for the first time. So now that our image is built, let's go ahead, we'll plug it into the Pi, and then we'll plug the Pi in and boot up for the first time. So the Pi first sets up, it's gonna take a while because it has to go ahead and resize the partitions. And it's gonna do all those great behind the scene things, but once that's done, you'll be greeted with the logo. And this might take a little while as well as it installs everything for you. So just sit back, get a coffee, relax, and well, you're gonna have to wait. Now when you get to the welcome screen, take note that I have one gamepad detected. That's an Xbox One controller that I have plugged in through USB. I recommend the first controller that you set up be a USB controller. And if you don't have one, you can go ahead and use a keyboard to set all this up. But since I do have one, I'm gonna go ahead and use that. So you really just hold any button down, it's gonna go ahead, recognize it, and start it off. And there's only a few buttons here if you don't have a regular controller. There's only a few buttons they actually need to map up. And that's your D-pad, so up, down, left, right, and I'm gonna use the start for the start and the select for the select and A. So the ones you actually really need to pay attention to there were the D-pad ones, at least up and down, left and right, start and A, or sorry, select and A. I would actually probably do B as well, as that's the, the back button. So I'll just go ahead, set the rest of these up. Now, if you miss one, don't worry about it. At the end, you can come back up and fix it, or if you just screw one up, But there we go, once we are done, just go ahead, hit OK, which will be your A button. So once at the main menu, I'm gonna go ahead and connect to Wi-Fi. Now, if you don't have Wi-Fi and you wanna do Ethernet, that's fine, just plug the Ethernet in, you can skip this step. But I need it, so it's gonna go ahead and set it up for me. So just go ahead, connect to Wi-Fi, pick your network and connect to it. It's a trap! Now I like to keep a USB powered keyboard and mouse just at the side, just in case I need to do this. But again, just hit B or go to the exit and then hit A. We now have Wi-Fi set up. Let's go into the RetroPie setup. And we'll be greeted with this screen. Go ahead, give it a read, hit OK. And there's a few things I like to do here. Update all installed packages. This is gonna take a while though, but make sure you do run through it. After that's done, I like to update my RetroPie setup script just to make sure we have the latest version. And once we've done that, I'll come back out. Now we have version 4.14. And again, I urge you to update all install packages. It's just gonna take probably north of 30 minutes. So I'll do it after the video is done. Just make sure you select the option and go through it. Now let's come down to manage packages. Come down to experimental. Come all the way down to the bottom. And I want to go to RetroPie Manager. I'll go ahead and activate this. And I'll install from source. This could take a couple minutes as well, but it's so worth it. Now, if you have a USB drive with a light on it, you can also install ROMs that way. But I find this way here to be much simpler. And this is one of the reasons why I want to make sure that I have Wi-Fi on my Pi. It's just so much simpler to be able to add and remove ROMs with a web browser over the USB stick. So what this is doing is going out and getting all of the source code for this package. It's gonna go out, grab it, pull it all down, compile it up, and then install it for you. If given the option to go from by either install from binary or source, I generally like to pick source, but it does take longer. 
it's just generally you get a more fresh, uh, a more recently updated version out of it that way. All right, once it's done, I'll return you back to here. If we want to go to configuration option, we'll go ahead and we'll select it. I want to make sure I enable RetroPie Manager on boot. And I'm also going to start it now since I don't need to reboot. With that done, I'm going to go ahead and cancel. And I forgot to actually look at my IP address. That's fine. We'll come down to package help. And take note here of the port. That's the important part. Every installation I've done has always installed it and used port 8000. So I'll go ahead, close this down. Let's go ahead. Let's keep heading back to our main RetroPie menu. And then I want to come down to show IP. Let's go ahead. We'll select that. This is going to show your RetroPie's IP based on where it is on your network. So mine is 192.168.1.29. Yours is going to be different. So make sure you write that down and also the port 8000. And we're going to go jump over to a web browser. So the IP address for my Pi was 192.168.1.29 and on port 8000. And if we go ahead and type that in, it's going to connect to the retro Pi. Now you do have to make sure that they are on the, on the same network. So this is kind of cool. You can go ahead and monitor your system and you can monitor the activity on all the cores, the memory, the temperature, and how much space you have left on your card. You can also edit some of your configuration files for not just RetroPie, but also for the Linux installation underneath it. But the main thing we want to take a look here is that manage the ROM files. And also we're going to want to take a look at BIOS files as well. As some of our systems are going to require about BIOS files, but we'll go ahead, we'll start with ROM. We'll pick one that does not require a special BIOS. So these are all of the systems that are in there automatically. You can go ahead, use this drop down to add more simply by selecting it and then just hitting add. There we go. We have the Amiga, but I've got a ROM over here for the Super Nintendo and adding ROMs is as simple as opening up the web browser, taking the zipped file. Now you can use the uncompressed version if you wish. I tend to actually use the compressed version. It's a little bit slower to load, but it saves a bit, a bit of space. So here we go. I've gone ahead and added one. We don't have access to it. And that's because we got to do a quick restart, at least of the emulation station. So if we go back and take a look at our RetroArch install, so just hit the start key, come down to quit and just restart emulation station. You do not have to restart the whole thing unless you've done some upgrades to the actual underlying Linux install. But now that I have that done, since I have one game installed for Super Nintendo, Super Nintendo now shows up in my menu. There's the one game I've added. And if we go ahead and select it, it's going to go and load that game up for us. Ah, 1990. <laughs> Good old Super Nintendo games. And there we go. We can now go ahead and start playing all of our classic games that we all grew up and still love. Now there's a ton of other things we can do with this as far as scraping, setting up different type of displays as we go through all of the different menus. Now we can continue on with that in another video if you want to go ahead and upgrade our install of RetroPie. But one quick note to get out of games, hit start and select together. And that'll bring you back out to the menu. I guess I'm going to go ahead, sit down, start installing that update. And while I do that, I guess we'll edit this video and get it up. If you have any other questions, go ahead and leave them down below and I'll ask them as best as I can. But as always, I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.